going to get started here. My name is Jim Shanahan. I'm the Associate Chief of Policy and Education. I'm the next installment of our colloquium here. And it's a fun job for me to introduce a speaker about, what, 12 years ago? 10 years ago, I had a grad student come work with me at Cornell. Um, turned out to be uh, one of the most frequent and uh, interesting contributors to topics on science communication, environmental communication, media effects, the topics of interest to me. Then I got mad. That joke fell flat. Talking about Matt, of course. Um, Matt was my screen. Matt, did. Matt was my advisee at when I worked at Cornell uh, about ten years ago, and I've been really proud to see the, the, the things that he's done since then. Uh, working, doing good work on all the topics that I just mentioned. Um, he's been a professor at Ohio State, and he's now associate professor in the School of Communication, I guess it is, at American University. And I'm happy to welcome him here today. The title of his talk. Visions of a Sustainable Future, Journalists as Published Intellectuals in the Climate Debate. So please welcome Matt Nisbet. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm okay. thrilled to... Let me just start. I'm thrilled to, uh, to be here today, to be able to uh, talk to uh, all of you. I'm very excited to be here at the College of Education uh, because you guys are, are really doing innovative things. You guys are, as students, you're very lucky, lucky to be at a college uh, that's really at, at the cutting edge. As Dean uh, Fiedler has, has written and talks about, like Wayne Gretzky, you're trying to skate to where the puck is going to be, you're trying to anticipate the changes in the field and adapt your programs uh, to those changes. So, uh, as students here, uh, it's a great opportunity for you to be here at the College of, of Communication. Uh, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, over the last 10 years, I've been studying uh, public opinion and uh, media coverage uh, about controversies over science and the environment. Uh, a rough start, that's okay. Uh, when, you, when you teach, you know you always have to deal with uh, different types of AV problems. So, that's, that's a great um, so over the last 10 years, I've been studying uh, public opinion about controversies over science and the environment in different areas of technology. I've looked at the debate over stem cell research, I've looked at the debate over food biotechnology, the debate over the teaching of evolution in, in schools. And over the last four or five years, I've been studying uh, most closely the debate over over climate change. Not only how the public comes to decide and make judgments about these complex areas of research and these problems, but also how the media covers uh, these issues. And so I've done a, a lot of different types of studies that you as students are familiar with. So large-scale public opinion research and analysis, uh, experiments looking at how you present or frame different types of stories or different types of messages, how that shapes judgments and decisions among the public. And then also large-scale content analysis of trends and patterns in media coverage as they uh, cover and portray these complex topics uh, over time. Uh, but over the last few years, as, as I've done this research, and I've also written about it in different popular contexts, I've uh, written a blog uh, consistently since 2005. And when you're writing a blog, you, it truly is social media. You get introduced to a lot of different people. Uh, their ideas, and your own ideas are challenged, as well as your own assumptions. You get to sort of experiential learning to try to understand how people come to judgments and uh, how they uh, try to describe these complex problems. I've also worked with a lot of different NGO groups. And the more I did that, I came to realize that just as important to understand the judgments and the decisions of the public is to also understand how elites, how policy staffers, how decision makers, how journalists themselves might be influenced by these same processes. How is it that journalists make coverage decisions about how to tell the story about climate change? 
uh, how do policy staffers uh, understand the complexities of climate politics? What might be the barriers to action and what might be the menu of policy options that we should uh, pursue uh, to deal with the problem like that? So the more I looked at it, I started to, to, to recognize that uh, public intellectuals, experts and journalists who are writing about these issues in a popular way, many times as high-profile bestsellers and as high-profile media celebrities and stuff sometimes, they are shaping often the mental models and the judgments and decisions of a small group of influentials. Uh, so uh, last summer with a colleague of mine in the journalism department, uh, Declan Fahey, we started to try, we, we, we launched a research program in this area to try to understand the role of journalists as public intellectuals in science policy debates, but other debates, such as debates over uh, globalization, the food system, and some other topics that I'll, I'll talk about today. And so in our first study, we looked at uh, the media impact uh, for uh, the book by Rebecca Sloot, a science journalist, called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And as many of you know, when you write a best-selling book, this book was on the bestseller list, New York Times bestseller list, for more than a year on hardcover, and it's still on the bestseller list for the paperback, uh, paperback list. Um, when you launch a book, you go on a book tour, and often the impact of the book is more so not necessarily on direct readers, and certainly many people have read this book. It sold over uh, a couple million copies. Uh, but a lot of your influence is also the campaign, your marketing campaign, and how the book is reviewed, the NPR interviews that you do, the profiles that are written about you. And in that proce process, in making decisions about how to write your book, how to describe, how to create a narrative, how to frame a complex topic, and then the talking points and the narratives that you create through those, those profiles and that reviewers pick up on, you start to set the frame of reference for thinking about a complex topic. So in this book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, it's both a, a narrative about the daughter of a woman who had cells taken from her without her knowledge back in the 1950s, and those cells are now the basis for a lot of research in biomedical science. Uh, but Rebecca Sloot tells a story about her daughter who's coming to terms with the success of this research and also different issues related to privacy and informed consent. And Rebecca Sloot also tells her own personal narrative of working on this book for, for 10 years. But in the process, in looking at this very complex issue, an issue that's increasingly important, looking at issues related to tissue research and the removal of tissues and other uh, blood and other, uh, uh, other things, cells from, uh, from, from patients and their use in biobanks and biomedical research, she had certain uh, choices to make about what, what's really relevant policy-wise. And not only certain choices to make, but what's really relevant in terms of ethics. So what we wanted to do in this first study was to look at when journalists wrote about this book, when they interviewed her, when they profiled it, pro profiled her in the book, and when they uh, um, uh, wrote feature stories or op-eds, what were the ethical themes that were most emphasized? Uh, and how might that shape uh, the overall debate over our biomedical research and tissue research? And what we found was in these 125 reviews and profiles and interviews, that we looked at across news organizations, the United States, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. The relative framing of the, of the relevant ethical issues were re was relatively narrow, focused on informed consent, compensation to patients, and the welfare of the patient. Much less uh, likely to be emphasized were questions about scientific progress. Under what conditions do you balance scientific progress with other ethical concerns? About control and access, patenting of biomedical research and the control of tissues once they leave a patient's body by that, uh, by that patient. Accountability, oversight, and regulation, and far less frequently mentioned or emphasized across these profiles were discussions of privacy, public education, or anything related to, say, patients' rights or advocacy. So that was, it. That was interesting to look at. And in fact, the Columbia Journalism Review has a big piece online today uh, about uh, a recent op-ed that Rebecca Sloot uh, wrote in New York Times on Sunday looking at privacy issues related to tissue research and talks about the relevance of our study. You can check that out on, on the front page of, of, of CGR. Um, but then in the fall, I started a, um, my sabbatical uh, semester. I, I was a visiting fellow at the Shorenstein Center at the Kennedy School. And during that time, I, I started to think about, well, there's something more here. There's, there's uh, uh, more than just looking at uh, how, an, uh, how a book 
uh, is discussed in media profiles and reviews. And there's really a, a different type of author uh, than uh, someone like Rebecca Sploot that's important to think about. And these are authors that I call knowledge journalists, best-selling uh, best uh, journalists and writers who are today some of our leading public intellectuals. Many of you know them or have read their books. People like Malcolm Gladwell, the picture above, or people like Michael Pollan uh, below. And what's, new, what's unique about these, these journalists is rather than necessarily straight reporting or reporting on events, they tend to view the word, world deductively. They're trying to look across the events and offer up a synthesis and a broader or grander explanation of what this all means. Um, rather than straight reporting, they often do deep immersion where they actually read themselves scientific studies. Sometimes in reading scientific studies, they come to question the conclusions of those scientific studies, and they try to piece together individual studies into a broader uh, narrative. And when I started to think about this, I started to turn to the literature over time on the role of public intellectuals uh, generally, both journalists and academics who are writing for a popular audience, and what their impact might be. And there's a fair amount of literature, a little bit of literature on that. It hasn't really been updated over the last 10 years, but one of the more interesting book is, uh, books is by Richard uh, Posner, who's a legal theorist and a public intellectual himself that came out uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And one of the definitions of a public intellectual is that they're a social critic rather than merely a social observer. They are at once engaged and detached. So this was interesting, but I figured I had some more work to do. I needed to figure out uh, what was unique or essential or different about these journalists as public intellectuals, and then how can you think about how they do their work? How do they become public intellectuals? How do they become super achievers and outliers? And what kind of impacts do they have on policy debates? The thinking and the judgments of elites, and also the coverage decisions of, of other journalists. And this is really important for a number of different reasons to think about. One is, we're living in, in what is possibly a new era of explanatory and accountability journalism. There's a lot of concern about the, the decline of explanatory journalism. And certainly we need to figure out new, new business models. But now there are more outlets, more mediums, more platforms by which to tell complex stories than any time in history. And certainly here at the College of Communication, you're looking at this through conferences like the Power, the Power of Narrative, or the New England uh, Center on Investment Reporting, or the Center on Journalism, uh, and in medicine. And the good news is that there seems to be a built-in hunger or audience for this type of journalism, this type of long-form explanatory and accountability journalism. This is, on the right here, this is from the recent uh, Pew report on the future of the media. You can see here, uh, while the circulation for Time and Newsweek has declined uh, quite dramatically over the last 10 years, and now Newsweek is no longer running in print, you can see from the New Yorker, sort of our gold standard for long-form journalism, their circulation has remained consistent in about a million over the last 10 years. And the circulation of The Economist and The Atlantic, even The Week, which is a compilation and a synthesis, a short a shorter compilation and synthesis of events, has actually increased over the last 10 years. Those of you that you listen to podcasts on NPR, listen to public radio, public radio international, Right? You know that their audience share has increased. And there's very successful new formats for storytelling, like Radiolab. Bloomberg is doing really innovative things with uh, data-based journalism and analytical journalism. This is just one example. Bloomberg uh, government, which is actually hiring a lot of journalists and also data analysts, different types of journalists, different types of people to work uh, at the news organization. The other thing that's happened through uh, uh, initiatives like the Carnegie Knight uh, Initiative on the Future of Journalism uh, is to figure out a, a, a new way of training journalism students and also a new way of, of reporting. Um, and one of the ideas is how do you create within a journalism school at the undergrad or a master's level the type of situation that Knight Fellows at MIT or Neiman Fellows at Harvard Experience or Shorenstein Fellows, where they spend a year or a semester sort of in deep immersion with research and scholarship, talking to a variety of experts, and then drawing on that research and scholarship in the reporting. Uh, Tom Patterson, who's a professor at the Kennedy School of Government uh, at the Shorenstein Center, is uh, coming out with a book where he talks about the need for knowledge-based journalism, where he makes the argument is that the, the goal should be to build the use of scientific and scholarly research more deeply into the journalism curriculum. He says, just as journalists, journalism students or journalists rely on reporting as a basic technique, 
they should also rely on searching through the literature and using research to inform uh, the reporting. And they started uh, the Journalist Resource, which is an amazing aggregation and, and compilation of studies that are ready made for journalists to deep dive into as well as students. Uh, and so I started thinking about this project. If I can look at the, uh, as a complement to these types of questions and these types of initiatives, if I can look in this project, and what should eventually be a book, if I can look in deep, uh, deeply at profiles of these super achievers and these outliers, these knowledge journalists, then we have complementary case studies by which to understand how these super achievers use research, tell stories, manage careers, manage their careers, and impact debates. So that's one of my goals uh, in doing this first paper that I released uh, over the last couple of weeks and building it into a broader book project. So who are these people? How can we start to think about these journalists and these writers who are high-profile public intellectuals, probably best known for their best-selling books, but in many cases are sometimes national and global brands that uh, transcend even the brand of their own uh, news organization. And in developing this paper at the Shorenstein Center, and since the paper that came out a couple of weeks ago, I've had several comments or questions that sort of uh, sparked my thinking along these lines. Well, one of the questions is, not all of these authors are journalists, either journalistically trained or maybe might be commonly thought of as journalists. They might be more likely to be uh, thought of as a writer, uh, whereas others might be consider themselves a journalist and they're journalistically trained writing for a news organization. Most all of them specialize in synthesis, right? but some people do straight synthesis in storytelling, while others have, across their careers, have moved more directly into advocacy, sometimes activism, as I'll talk about with the example of Bill McKibben. So some of these examples, here is Stephen Dubner, who's a co-author of Freakonomics, also now does Freakonomics Radio. Um, he is actually has an MFA in writing from Columbia, but he started his career at the New York Times and the New Yorker, and now considers himself a journalist, calls himself a journalist, and writes journalistically. You have people like uh, Gary Taubes, who is a science writer who writes about food and diet. Elizabeth Colbert, who's a, uh, a writer from The New Yorker and writes a lot about climate change. Uh, people like Malcolm Gladwell, maybe the, one of the highest profile in, in this category, which many of you have probably read his book or at least know uh, who he is. We also have in this category columnists. We have people like Tom Friedman, who I'll talk about more in detail. But we also have people like Fareed Zakharia or David Brooks. David Brooks and Fareed Zakharia, maybe you might not consider themselves journalists. Uh, David Brooks started the National Review as a writer. And now he's a columnist today, also writing best-selling uh, books. Douglas Ruchkoff would consider himself a writer, but he writes journalistically in a synth synthetic way. He considers himself a media theorist and also a media advocate. Uh, and then you have Phil McKibben and Naomi Klein. Uh, so in the, in the paper that I wrote uh, this last fall, uh, released from the Shorenstein Center, I decided to look at journalists writing in the space about climate change, sustainability, and energy, focusing here in green on Andrew Rebkin, who's a longtime reporter for the New York Times and now writes the Dot Earth blog, Tom Friedman, who's their columnist and is the author of Hot, Flat, and Crowded, and Bill McKibben, who wrote the first popular book about climate change in 1989 and more recently has turned to advocacy and activism, sort of reinventing the way that environmental groups uh, practice politics, to try to look at them more deeply and to start to develop sort of these, these profiles. And in the eventual book project that I'm focusing on, each one of these authors will be an individual chapter. So we'll be able to deep dive into the career of these authors, their approach to the problem, and by reading about these authors, you'll also come to understand the history of the problems that they're writing about, such as uh, Tom Friedman writing about globalization, or Naomi Klein writing about capitalism, Douglas Rushkoff writing about media trends in the internet, or, history, uh, or marketing and public relations. Okay, so I needed to start to think about what, what, what are earlier um, uh, precedents for thinking about the influence in the style by which these journalists and writers approach their work. And certainly one of the prototypes for a modern day knowledge journalism, uh, knowledge journalist today is, is Walter Littman. You can think about Walter Littman, who had a 40 year journalism career, won multiple Pulitzer Prizes, helped found the New Republic, and was a long standing uh, columnist and also a popular book author. Uh, you can think of his role as both a teacher and an advisor. Certainly he saw his role as being a teacher and an advisor. His motivation was to capture uncertainty and complexity in the world and always to focus on the long view. Not to focus on, say, concrete events as they're happening, but offer up readers a long view of the world in terms of policy and politics. 
He used his books like the classic public opinion as a way to define his philosophy, but his columns then as a way to translate, apply, and diffuse, and to promote his uh, philosophy. Um, Littman viewed himself and other columnists as indispensable, as expert analysts guiding a public that didn't have the capacity or, or the capability for deeper understanding of what was really important. They would, he as a journalist would be a translator and a synthesizer and a teacher. Teacher about complex things like the Great Depression uh, or World War. As a teacher, he believed also that academic theory frequently needed to be reinterpreted and readjusted to fit practical political realities. But also as an advisor, he knew that he was writing for an audience of policy experts, sometimes the president or a member of Congress. And they were among his readers, and he was also serving then as an, sometimes as an advocate or as a teacher. Today, uh, Tom Friedman is a great example of this model of, of, of Walter Lippmann. Here you can see Tom Friedman at the, da the Davos World Economic Forum with Al Gore and Bono, hanging out with world leaders, certainly being read wi uh, widely and frequently at the White House. Fried Zakharari would be another person in this model. Here you can see President Obama carrying his book, um, The Post-American World, and being a lot of discussion about Fried Zakharari being a, uh, an advisor on the Middle East to the White House, along with people also by uh, Tom Friedman, somewhat controversially. Well, there's a different type of writer as well, or journalist, particularly a different type of journalist, other than the columnist in the model of Walter Littman. And these are veteran science journalists who serve not only as explainers and synthesizers, but also as informed critics often. So John Horgan, one of the first books I read in graduate school was his book, The End of Science, where he explained scientific paradigms and actually challenged the, sort of popularized the sociology of science. Um, or Andrew Revkin, as I'll talk about more in detail. Or Gary Tobbs, who's written about uh, the science of why we get fat, trying to explain to us, often challenging scientific paradigms. What these informed critics, these veteran science journals often do is they often take you upstream, not at the end product of science as is portrayed in a press release or a study, but actually trying to explain why science was done, opening up the process of expert knowledge, sometimes positing alternative uh, alter interpretations or drawing connections to ongoing debates about a field. They oftentimes challenge scientific paradigms, and I'll talk in more detail about how Andrew Redkin might do this in writing his God Earth blog. And they also critique coverage by journalists or the public relations strategies or claims made by advocates, industry groups, uh, or sometimes scientists uh, themselves. So you have the Walter Lippmann model teacher and advisor, and you have the veteran science journalist as an informed critic, but particularly writing in the space of environmental problems and climate change, you have as a model for knowledge journalism the work of Rachel Carson uh, as the author of Silent Spring. Uh, so her biographer, one of her biographers, William Souter, referred to, uh, talked about Carson's style, and there's also a recent journal article on this, about actually magnifying uncertainty for readers, being honest and open about the uncertainty about, say, the links between pesticides and cancer, but doing so in a very rigorous way, as William Souter developing a technique where Carson was a relentless reviser, relying on a vast network of experts, scientists, scholars, and physicians who reviewed and commented uh, on her work. But in being open and talking a lot about uncertainty, she also contextualized that discussion of uncertainty within powerful metaphors. A powerful metaphor around what is, the human what is, what is human's place relative to nature? Should we control nature or should we be in harmony or equilibrium with nature? Uh, writing in 1962, and this is still a metaphor that often influences environmental writers and environmental advocates today, she compared pesticide use and control of nature to nuclear holocaust and the threat of uh, nuclear escalation. Pesticides for her were a side of her grave new technological hubris, employing vivid imagery to engage her audiences. She invoked images of nuclear bomb-like devastation. As one of her other biographers said, she wanted us to understand that we were just a blip. The control of nature was an arrogant idea. For many environmental writers today, Rachel Carstone is a touchstone and a prototype. Bill McKibben, who I'll talk about in more detail in 2008, said she was the first person to take the shine off the idea of progress and to make us reconsider whether all was quite uh, as it seemed. So these are interesting models, these are interesting prototypes that have shaped the work of journalists today, are doing similar things to knowledge journalists today, but knowledge journalists have sort of uh, innovated and gone beyond the work uh, of these early prototypes as well, as we'll talk about. <coughs> 
One of the important things to also consider is that a knowledge journalist, journalist doesn't happen overnight. So for those of you that have heard of Joan O'Lear, who's writing about neuroscience, who is involved in a, a major scandal about plagiarism, he was sort of an overnight sensation in, in his early 20s, mid-20s. He's writing bestsellers explaining neuroscience, right? How does that happen? How do you go from college or a, a master's degree to suddenly writing bestsellers about ne neuroscience? What's often overlooked about, about these outliers and super achievers is that yes, they, they benefit from their platforms such as writing for the New York Times in New York or sometimes university affiliations, but these institutions are often a laboratory where they've put in many years and many hours learning their trade, developing their sources, and developing a deep synthesis and understanding of expert knowledge in an area. So for example, Tom Friedman started his career with UPI as a Beirut bureau chief in the early 1980s, which reflected his intense interest since high school and college in the Middle East. Uh, before being named a regular New York Times columnist in 1995, he, he served then as the State Department correspondent, the White House correspondent, and then the International Economics correspondent. By the time he published Hot, Flat, and Crowded in 2008, his book about globalization, climate change, and energy, Friedman had written 1,200 columns for the New York Times. He had won three Pulitzers. He published four previous books, including The World is Flat, and hosted six documentaries at the New York Times uh, Discovery Channel site, including several on energy and climate change. <coughs> it was through that experience, those networks, and also that profile and brand that he built over time that explains the success, or helps explain the success of his book, Hot, Flat, and Crowd. And I'll talk about other things that Tom Friedman uniquely does as well to be an influencer and an outlier. Andrew Revkin uh, earned his graduate a degree in journalism from Columbia University. He, uh, he majored as an undergrad in biology before he went to graduate school. Then he, he went to the South Pacific and he went on, uh, he joined a, a, a boat and he sailed 12,000 miles, or 15,000 miles, visiting 15 different countries on a fellowship. After graduate school, he worked at the Science Digest in Los Angeles Times before joining Discover Magazine, where in 1990, uh, 1988, he wrote one of the first co national cover stories on climate change. In 1990, he published The Burning Season, which was about Chico Mendes, a rainforest activist who was killed, which was then turned into an HBO movie starring Raul Julia. He did all that before joining the New York Times in 1995 where he joined the Metro Desk. He had a start on the Metro Desk, even with all that experience, uh, covering environmental issues in part in the New York area. He spent five years there before being named the National Environment Correspondent uh, in 2000. And in 2007, he launched the Dot Earth blog before taking a buyout in 2010 and staying on as a contractor. As a journalist in the New York Times, he filed 1,200 stories, approximately 300 focusing primarily on climate change. And in the early 2000s, he was one of the first Times journalists to do multimedia reporting, going to the Arctic, taking his own photographs as, as well as video, and writing this children's book also based on his reporting and, and, uh, and the media images that he took while he was in the Arctic. Bill McKibben, he was the president of the Harvard Crimson in college. He graduated in 1982 and immediately joined The New Yorker as a staff writer, where he wrote the talk of the town in the news and notes sections. And as he's often recalled, he said his, his time at the, at the New Yorker, the five years he spent there, he says one of the wonderful things about writing for the New Yorker was I was able to write an, anonymously, which is very different from how journalism is often done today um, in terms of people wanting that, that byline right away. I'd send a piece to Mr. Sean, his editor, and get back a galley with a very good set of questions. He says it was amazing to discover in a 700-word piece how many places you've been unclear and imprecise, open to interpretation, and on and on. And while he's there, he modeled his later career off, uh, off of an influential New Yorker writer at that time, Jonathan Schell, who was writing best-selling books and influential books on nuclear disarmament and was an inspiring voice to anti-nuclear activists. He says, from Jonathan Schell that I learned how great reporting could produce critical thinking. It was a liberating reprieve from the twin straitjackets of objective reporting and punditry. So not only... Uh, are these knowledge journalists, not only do they uh, spend many years at their news organization developing the craft and the trade, sometimes come from specialized backgrounds as well as undergraduates or through graduate degrees. That helps them be successful. But they also have a unique ability <coughs> to be personalities, to turn into celebrities, and eventually into global commodities. So one of the things that they do as best-selling authors in giving interviews, the profiles that are written about them, uh, 
how they uh, manage their, uh, their careers is they often merge their public and their private selves. So they relate stories about themselves in their books, in their articles, or in their blog posts that relate to then the reporting or the writing that they're doing. And oftentimes, these personal anecdotes are, 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 are the, um, often these take the example of personal anecdotes, journeys, or realizations. Tom Friedman takes you on a, 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 a tour across the world where you meet, meet uh, CEOs and scientists and interesting people. You think of him, you, part of his construction of authority is that he has special access to people that you don't have access to. They also establish their authority and authenticity through, uh, through uh, a sign of personal commitment. Bill McKibben uh, is the ultimate environmentalist. Right? He personifies the values that he writes about uh, in his books, or at least appears to do so. They walk the walk. They practice what they preach. Most are also commodities, in that people like Bill McKibben or Michael Pollan, they are constantly blurbing or writing forwards to other books about the food system or environment. Um, Tom Friedman, in a profile in New York, or a high school friend said that Tom Friedman would have been a great advertising or PR man, because he knows how to market, he knows how to brand himself. Um, and oftentimes they're wrapped up in a dense network and web of transactions that might be often total millions of dollars through their best sellers and then cross promotions like Freakonomics Radio. And they also successfully use social media, so Bill McKibben has 70,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, Andrew Revkin has 100,000 plus followers on Facebook and 60,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, and he's also, also posting across different types of social media platforms. And so then that takes us also now, even though knowledge journalists are perhaps, they rise in their career and they're best known for their best selling books, and maybe if they're also doing multimedia, they're best known for public radio interviews, and sometimes they might appear on PBS, they seldom appear on cable news which helps distinguish them a bit from the pundits that you see commonly on, on, on cable news. But now in sort of the quickly changing world of online journalism, uh, there are very important brands that help drive traffic across media platforms. So how many people are familiar with, raise your hand if you've seen Bill McKibben's uh, article last year at Rolling Stone magazine called Global Warming's Terrifying News? <coughs> okay. A couple of you. This was uh, liked on Facebook uh, 1.2 million times, tweeted 1.4 million times. It's the most viewed article in the history of Rolling Stone uh, magazine. Um, here, this is a column that Tom Friedman wrote about Bill McKibben's protest against the uh, Keystone Pipeline, uh, where he uh, said, uh, go crazy, supporting the protesters and saying that if Obama approves the pipeline, and the protesters deserve something big back, right? What you see now at places like the New York Times or the Washington Post, they're highly paid co columnists, no longer are news editors and producers producing a printed magazine or a newspaper where there's a hierarchy of journalist-determined agenda of stories, where they're determining for you what the most important stories might be of the day. Rather, when you go to the New York Times website, you can either personalize it or go immediately to a section and deep dive, deep dive only the content that you prefer. But you can also go to that section and see what's the most emailed, what's the most commented, what's the most viewed. And so what you see in this new media ecosystem around these knowledge journalists who often have these global <coughs> brands, they're no longer just writing for the circulation of the New York Times in the United States. They have a global following and readership. There's this online traffic and spirals of attention that happen through meta-commentary, what bloggers are saying in reaction and then what people are tweeting about relative to that page, which then drives more attention and more discussion. So this is Bill McKibben referring to Tom Friedman using sort of his trademark sense of humor, saying when Tom Friedman wrote supporting uh, the, the protest against the tar sands pipeline, we're definitely getting Tom Friedman on the guest list for the next civil disobedience action, so he can be arrested at the next, the next protest, right? Sending his followers uh, 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 to that site, uh, to his column, to read it. Perhaps what is most influential about, a knowledge, about knowledge journalists as public intellectuals is that they set the discourses, the narratives by which we come to understand complex problems. Uh, in the literature on public intellectuals, they, uh, they write about uh, forming communities of assumptions. They help create uh, uh, 
the, the assumptions by which we think about these complex issues. So by calling attention to specific disciplines and networks of experts, they help define which experts or views might be mainstream versus what might be contrarian or, or out of bounds. And over time, as a best-selling book comes out, and then other journalists pick up on those narratives, and other public intellectuals uh, pick up on those uh, narratives, assumptions and legitimate authorities are established. And it becomes costly in terms of human mental labor to re-examine what has finally come to be taken for granted. And so what's needed then are other public intellectuals, it's written about in the literature, other public intellectuals to disturb the canonical piece and to defil defil def defamiliarize the obvious, challenging the established paradigms by identifying the flaws in conventional wisdom and by offering alternative renderings of a problem. So one of the things that then I go into in the Shorenstein paper uh, that you can read online is sort of a deep dive into the different types of discourse traditions uh, that each one of these authors offer up on climate change and what that influence might be, focusing most closely on Bill McKibben. And this is a, especially relevant for a problem like climate change. Climate change is talked about, I think, accurately as a wicked problem or a super wicked problem meaning that it's complex, it has multiple causes. Oftentimes when we think we have a solution, we pursue that solution, it might lead to more problems, such as was the case with uh, biofuels or cap and trade led to more polarization. And when we have these complex, uncertain, wicked problems, the more complex they are, the more likely we are to have equally plausible discourses and narratives about what should be done. And what happens with these wicked problems is they become almost like a uh, an ink block test that people read different things into these wicked problems and mobilization on these wicked problems is an opportunity for different groups to mobilize on behalf of their values, goals and vision for society so what's been written about looking at discourses about, these, about climate change in particular is that only by looking at the stories that we tell about climate change can we recognize that the sources of our enduring disagreements lie within us in our values, in our sense of identity and purpose. So let's take a moment here to look at the narrative, the narratives and the discourses by which Bill McKibben has written about the problem of climate change and now advocates on behalf of action. But one way to think about Bill McKibben's books, and he wrote his first book in, in 1989, he's published uh, more, than, more than 10 since, is that he's writing it sort of in the modern tradition of of Thoreau and Emerson and other American romantics and transcendentalists. Uh, as the historian William Cronin writes of McKibben and this tradition, wild regions like national parks are frequently likened to Eden itself and viewed as the one place we can turn to for escape from our own consumption, our consumption, uh, uh, sort of the, the things that we see harmful about modern civilization. They're also the place that, uh, in nature, we can find that the supernatural lay just beneath the surface, enabling people to glimpse the face of God, writes Cronin. Another historian, Richard White, in writing about the tradition of Bill McKibben, says that he uses the old transcendentalist trick from Emerson, where nature and community become instruments to argue deeper truths. For example, a farmer's market is a sign of a quiet revolution that will change everything. The revolution concerns an idea that economic growth and material things will not make us happy. McKibben also writes in the tradition of the deep ecology and limits to growth movement, which was, uh, came about in the 1970s and was maybe the dominant paradigm for thinking about environmental problems in the 1970s. So in doing so, in applying this traditional limits to growth, he often he uses the metaphor of overshoot and collapse, that through consumption and through overpopulation, and the release of greenhouse gases, we're facing catastrophe down the road. We're on the verge of collapse as a civil civilization and relatively environment. Uh, we've exceeded the caring capacity of the planet. And as a consequence, then society needs to deprioritize economic growth. Imagine saying that today when all we talk about is job growth and economic growth. But since 1989, McKibben has been arguing that we need to deprioritize economic growth and to instead focus on quality of life. And, but this societal change will only happen through widespread activism. In doing so, there's an idealization of a sort of a Jeffersonian agrarian economy. One of McKibben's most recent books is called Deep Economy, where he sort of talks about the ideal model for the world in terms of a social organization is New England, and thinking about small 
uh, small towns or small cities that rely on local agriculture, local power, and resolve differences through deliberation in Vermont-style town meetings. And the focus here is on locally-based appropriate technologies, such as solar and wind. And there tends to be a general, a, ge a general deep suspicion of things like genetic engineering and nuclear energy. Tom Friedman writes in a very different tradition in thinking about environmental problems, the tradition that I call the green growth perspective. In this perspective, drawing on uh, uh, books such as Natural Capitalism, uh, or the work of economists like um, Jeffrey Sachs, limits to growth can be stretched if the right policies and reforms are, are adopted. This is where we talk about sustainable development. It combines a focus on a soft path, efficiency, solar, and wind, with a pricing mechanism, like a carbon tax, right? So through technocratic approaches and engineering, we can solve this problem, harnessing the forces of the market. And we don't have to give up economic growth. In fact, for Friedman, as he writes in Hot, Flat, and Crowded, the world is a growth machine that no one can turn off. Instead, in sort of his classic coinage of a term in his branding, we need a code green, which is sort of his modern outlook on a soft path approach that would create abundant, cheap, clean, reliable electrons. The solution is not activism in overturning the, the status quo, but rather leveraging the greatest innovation engine God ever created, which is a combination of American research, universities, venture capital, and the marketplace. And if we do this, uh, uh, Friedman argues, America will have its mojo back. America will have its identity back, not to mention its self-confidence, because it will again be leading the world like it did during the Cold War on the most important strategic mission and values issue uh, of the day. So these, the green growth perspective is the dominant perspective, the dominant sort of mental model that we have in thinking about the problem of climate change. Most of the well-funded big environmental groups work within the green growth approach. And Tom Friedman has done a lot in sort of popularizing this approach and introducing it as people often argue to the business class, CEOs, you know, other business leaders to get them on board with action on climate change. But it's not the only way to think about the problem of climate change. And much less considered and prominent, the growing prominent uh, 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 tradition is what I call the green Prometheans. These are environmentalists and also journalists who not only question the romantic ideal of nature separate from humans, um, but they also argue that environmentalists have long suffered from a technological bias towards a soft path, only focusing on solar, wind, efficiency, and a pricing market uh, mechanism, like a carbon tax or cap and trade. And instead, we need to be much more open to the need for technological innovation and a broader menu of technological approaches, being open to natural gas as a bridge fuel, nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, genetically engineered food, and geoengineering. And these are a couple examples. Uh, Stuart Brand, who's a well-known environmentalist going back to the 1960s, has a great book called Polar Discipline. Mark Linus is a writer in the UK. There's a new book out called The God Species, and he's got a lot of attention for challenging the work of groups like Greenpeace on genetic engineering as a former environmental activist himself. So these are, the, um, these are some of the major uh, discourse traditions that these knowledge journals write in, but there's a different style that's also emerging for doing knowledge journalism. And that's a style that's using the technology of blogs and other social media to do what Jay Rosen at New York University calls uh, network, a network journalism approach to wicked problems. And it's consistent with what political theorists and also social scientists have written about what does it take, what kind of narratives or discourses or approaches are, are needed to try to overcome differences in polarization. John Dr uh, Dreisick, a political scientist in Australia, writes in trying to move beyond a single discourse and to try to think about journalism that bridges and blurs discourses and challenges assumptions the idea here is not just to highlight points of communality and sites for compromise, but also to provide possibilities for contestation and reflection it can induce. Jay Rosen writes in a speech to the UK Science Journalism Conference, in, in covering wicked problems, there is no kumbaya moment. You never get everyone on the same page, and you never reach consensus. But what is possible is a world where different stakeholders get that the world looks different to people who hold different stakes. Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus, who are public intellectuals and run the Breakthrough Institute in the, the journal Breakthrough Journal, write about wicked polarization. If we're going to overcome polarization as a wicked problem itself, 
We're going to end our ideological arms race. We need to redefine problems in ways to which partisans do not already know the answers. So a good example of this, maybe a leading example of this new style of network knowledge journalism is what Andrew Revkin, as a veteran science reporter writing in the informed critic model of science journalism, plays in writing the Dot Earth blog at the New York Times. He serves as an explainer, a synthesizer, an informed critic, and sometimes a challenging scientist, and also a convener of, of conversations. In doing so, he uses blogging technology to create a network of experts and sources and lay voices, commoners and others, who blur and bridge discourses at his blog. So here's a good example of how this works. This is a, a big study that got a fair amount of attention that came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, scientists at Cornell and Stanford came out with a paper saying uh, that New York State could be powered by a soft path approach to solar, wind, and efficiency and geothermal by 2050. So in writing about this study, and this is sort of a trademark way that uh, Revkin reports on a new study, he has his lead talking about what the findings of the study might be. He has a link to where you can find the paper itself, and he has a preference for linking and covering stories that are open access or studies that are open access. But look what he does here. He says, but like any good, he says, then he, then he frames it as an informed critic. He says, well, this is an interesting paper, but I see it more as a thought experiment because it doesn't deal with the political and social <coughs> challenges of trying to move to just solar wind and efficiency and geothermal in your state. So like any good thought experiment, the paper raises a host of questions, and he then poses those questions. So he's creating also a completely new type of narrative format for writing about science and doing this as well. And he says then, so here are my questions, and I, over email, he poses these questions to a diversity of experts. And then he takes excerpts from their emails back, and he starts a conversation, convenes a conversation uh, in his blog. And in this case, he ends the post then by saying, okay, what are people saying on Twitter about this study, right? And these are other sort of public intellectuals or journalists or experts tweeting about the study, right? So people that can follow what, what they're saying. Here's one, one other final example from uh, Revkin. Here's another major study that came out a couple weeks ago. Scientists find an abrupt warm jaw after a very long cooling. Revkin dubbed this the super hockey stick study where journalists are actually able to pattern and look at, uh, uh, look at climate change over 11,000 years, something they hadn't been able to do before. Right? So he has the lead talking about the study. He has a graph from the paper, a link to the, the paper, a link to the author's uh, profiles. And then what he often does is that he does Google Hangout. He does an interview with one of the scientists, a young scientist here at Harvard, over Google Hangout, where he has a 10-minute conversation with that scientist, asking him, uh, different questions as an informed critic, as, a, as someone who's covered the story for a long time based on his experience, but also then he's already emailed around to other experts to get their opinion of the study. And he draws on their comments and asks posing questions to this young scientist. And so you can watch the video, hear in the own words the scientists answering questions, and then you can read the comments from the other experts. And what was then funny about and interesting about this interview, the scientists then turned the tables on Redkin and said, you know, Andy, you've been covering this, this story and this issue for a long time. What do you think about this study? Where do you think what this all means? Where are we headed? And then you get 10 minutes of Revkin talking about his experience covering the story and what he thinks as a journalist slash expert public intellectual about the science. And particularly, he moves it into thinking about what might be the policy response. Um, so here you don't have any single narrative or perspective from a discourse tradition, but you have sort of a blurring and a bridging, and you have a different type of narrative structure and a lot of interaction. And then he ends this then with updates. So after the post appears, other experts might write in, or they might leave a comment, and then he highlights what those pers perspectives in, in an update at the end of the blog. Okay, so that's uh, a brief introduction to thinking about where I'm currently at in studying and analyzing uh, journalists as public intellectuals. I encourage you to check out the paper at the Shorenstein Center. If you go to my, uh, my research website, climateshiftproject.org, you can find a link to um, the study right there. You can also see what other people have written about the study. Andrew Revkin uh, blogged about it. There's been other things written about the study.
And you can also find the slides for the presentation in, in, in one of the top blog posts at the site. And you can, if you're interested more in this, you can follow me on Twitter. Here I am advertising the talk at BU a couple days ago. So thank you. I look forward to your comments and questions. Well, so one of the basic questions there is, is a lot of the really interesting science and research on why things go viral. So there's, uh, there's a few studies looking at, for example, what explains the most emailed story at the New York Times. Oftentimes, um, those are science stories. So one of the things that explains that the researchers think is that what explains why a story goes viral generally is a sense of wonder that people get from the story. So it's basically, what's the motivation for people to share a story? One is a sense of wonder that they might get from it. Another motivation is stories that you'll often see sort of news you can use as the most you know. Right? And that's because people see that story as being useful. They think a friend of theirs should know about it. But with these journalists, one of the real driving things is, uh, as journalists, the networks that they built, the brand identity, and the networks that they built up themselves. So a really important thing for a journalist to do today is actually, and it's a delicate balance to try to do this, is to build up your social media profile. So your Twitter following, your management of your Facebook, if you, if you have a professional Facebook page. So. Um, and because that's a way for, for you to start that online conversation and to drive traffic to your, to your own story, but also to develop your own personality. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a really interesting thing what's happening in journalism where now you have the brand of the news organization, but it's beyond the byline now for many, for many writers. Where through social media and other things that they're doing, sometimes popular books that they're writing, they're developing their own unique identity, their own unique personality and brand, which is very different from 10 years ago before we had Twitter and Facebook. And there's <coughs> very experienced journalists in the room that might want to talk about that some more. But if you look at what Redkin and McKibben do, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how much time they spend on social media. They're almost like constant personalities on that. Yes. I'm curious that, uh, and I like anything, anytime anybody links public intellectuals with the word journal, that's a good thing. Uh, but, uh, but I wonder about the very definition of journal. Because I would think Andrew Redkin would, uh, in, in, in my view, and most of you would be clearly identified as a journal. But I'm not so sure about Bill McKibben. I don't know how you decide Bill McKibben. This has nothing to do with what he's doing this week. Why he would be a journalist and say Glenn Beck, and Glenn Beck is a climate change denier and yep. argues from the other side. But would Glenn Beck qualify under your definition as a public intellectual? It certainly fits everything else that you've yeah, um, So he's a nut. Th those are really those are really good questions. Those are some some of the type of questions that we talked about in our, our Monday lunches at the Johnson Center as well. And, and uh, so I try to address some of those things in the current version of the paper. I'm going more deeply into, in, into the book, but real quick. So the McKibben is in that in that um, in that graph I showed you earlier on, on the continuum from someone that is probably closest to a, a writer, someone like Douglas Rushkoff or David Brooks, who started the National Review. Right? They write journalistically. McKibben started his career as a journalist in New York. Uh, early in his career, was referred to as a journalist, writing the first popular book about, about climate change. But over the course of his career, moved more into the, uh, the realm of being an advocate and uh, being a philosopher in some ways. What distinguishes um, someone like McKibben from um, Glenn Beck and other people that are frequently appear on cable news it's rare to see any of these people with the exception of maybe David Brooks on cable news. The cable news format often doesn't work well uh, for a lot of these writers and journals because they're not necessarily intelligent and what they are writing about doesn't necessarily boil down to the format of cable news. But what particularly distinguishes a lot of the pundits on cable news from these people is, is they're not doing the deep synthesis of knowledge in their work. So they're not, um, they're not uh, reading studies, talking to experts, and trying to present a um, uh, a detailed sort of synthetic analysis, big picture narrative about what it all means. 
Uh, sometimes they do, right? but oftentimes they're much more episodic, they're more event-driven, and they're really focused on analysis of sort of strategy and conflict. How will this play politically? Rather than, uh, so David Brooks does a lot of that. Right? But if you look at his books, right? If you look at his books and then often many times his columns, he's trying to, he's reading the scientific literature himself, he's talking to experts, and he's writing about sort of the science of morality or the science of like, um, of social welfare and um, uh, what's happening in society in terms of sociological trends. So, it, but it's, I agree with you, it's, it's not a hard line, right? And I know um, that. Uh, experienced journalists uh, uh, are, are likely to object to uh, putting uh, Bill McKibben in the category of knowledge journalists. Yeah, John O'Sara would not put Bill McKibben in the category of uh, of, of, of an advocate. And he and Tom Friedman are now kind of going back and forth over the he's going on the op-ed pages. Right. The so I would say that. So this is not um, this is not locked in time. So when when Bill McKibben started his career, he's more here, right around where say. They've done a push talk to Nicholas Carr, might be. But over the last five years, as he's become a leader of an advocacy organization, along with Brian McClellan, right, they've really moved down here. Tom Friedman, say, five years ago, might have been up here. But now that he's you know, advocating on behalf of no labels, labels of extreme centrism, right, he's moved closer towards his advocacy. Yes? Just sort of turn your question um, it seems to me that Walter Lippmann is the Uber journalist, and, and McKibben is a lot more like Walter Lippmann than Tom Friedman is. The same thing. So let me just ask the question a little bit differently. What distinctions do you make between journalists and writers? Yeah. And before you answer that, let me just say, you know, I define a journalist as a nonfiction writer who engages contemporary issues and events. So how yeah. do you distinguish the two? Well, I mean, I think there's different ways to think about it. Like, uh, one way to think about it is, is to go, um, one thing that we're, and, and I should say that my collaborator on this, uh, on the book project is, is my friend and uh, uh, colleague in the journalism department, Declan Fahey at, at AU. So one of the things we're going through is some of these traditions, like uh, uh, network journalism, new new journalism, long form journalism, pre precision journalism, the tradition of science journalism, we're kind of reviewing them and then saying what's essential or unique and how do we start to categorize these writers. Another relevant literature is to look at the literature on public intellectuals. And so what's been written about writers who are public intellectuals is you have academic public intellectuals. So people who are tenured professors, usually scientists and sociologists writing bestsellers. And then you have what are called bohemian public intellectuals. This comes out of New York City and sort of the new left of the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, people who do not have academic uh, positions and are writing popular books that are big idea books, and often writing in a journalistic style. Right? So people like um, Douglas Rushkoff and Phil McKibben might be in that category of bohemian public intellectual. Uh, but at the same time, they're also writing in a journalistic style. There's a big difference between the way they write. Phil McKibben writes in a classic New Yorker style. Uh, reviewing all of his work, I found my own writing becoming a lot better. I mean, he's really mastered that New Yorker article where he started his, started his career. So, so what's the difference between a writer and a journalist? Um, <clears throat> well, the, the, the difference, one difference is, do they call themselves a journalist? And do other people refer to them as a journalist, right? Another dif difference is, are they based in a news organization, right? Uh, are they journalistically trained? Uh, and sometimes people shift from here. So you look at someone like Elizabeth Colbert. Um, they refer to her as an environmental journalist. She writes for the New Yorker. She writes a popular book. And she sticks to probably mostly uh, straight synthesis. Uh, someone like uh, Stephen Dubner started his career at the New Yorker and the New York Times. So now he writes popular books and does radio programs. Uh, so it's easy to put them in this category over here. None of these writers really started, McKibben being an exception, started their career at a, at a mainstream news organization. David Brooks started at, at uh, the National Review, an alternative magazine. Uh, Reed Zachariah started a foreign policy magazine. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily, even though uh, Reed uh, Zachariah could go over here as well, because he works for CNN right now. So, um, you know, I would say that there isn't, it, in the way that these guys are writing, uh, in the popular formats, the writing form places like the New Yorker as well, 
there isn't a clear dividing line in this case between the journalist and the writer. What is different about them is that these are not, um, they might have university affiliations today, but they're not classically trained academics. They're not tenured professors. Uh, and they're not writing in an academic spot for a popular audience. Yes? Do you see any growth in the relation of this kind of writing and polarization of places? Knowledge journalists or non knowledge journalists staking out territories and being experts and heading to this polarization? Yeah, this is um, what, I, um, what I try to get to in more in the conclusion of the Shorenstein paper. And what I was talking about in terms of the need that if we are going to over overcome polarization, instead of having public intellectuals writing for an audience that shares their values within a single discourse tradition, and oftentimes taking the policy options to a complex problem and narrowing them down to just a few, we need more journalists and writers like Andrew Repkin, and perhaps blogging technology and online media now provides a unique technology where through this sort of process of network journalism where you can bring a lot more voices and perspectives into discussion and analysis of complex problems. Uh, and you can do it in a two-way two -way, two -way process rather than being uh, sort of the Walter Lippmann model of writing a column or a book where you're speaking to an audience, you're trying to um, facilitate and convene a conversation about the problem like Webkin does. Uh, it is blog. And what you'll see, what Rudkin, uh, he doesn't easily fit into any one of the discourse traditions, of, uh, the three that I showed you about climate change. He kind of spans the uh, green Prometheus <coughs> and the green growth paradigm. So in your paper, you suggest a way to move forward? Yeah, in the conclusion to the paper, I, I, I talk about Rudkin as being an alternative model for, um, and saying that and, and drawing out, I've written in other places about this that. Yeah, one of the reasons why we have a lot of polarization is that we, uh, even before we had a lot of media fragmentation, through best-selling authors like Rachel Carson, we were already sort of selecting ourselves into particular discourses and explanations of problems that reflected our values and were often very controversial among people on other sides of the political life. Uh, yes? Let's take one more question, and then I'm sure Matt can um, stay after to uh, talk a little bit more. So one more. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think, you know, it, it, I mean, it's, there's no easy answer there. I think there's a lot of benefits as an undergraduate to, uh, for example, carry a double major uh, in a specialized area. And I do know from uh, personal experience in Washington, D.C., where our own journalism students are getting the higher paying job jobs. It's in the types of news organizations that are looking for more of an analytical type journalism covering complex policy problems in a specialized way. Uh, and that's where a lot of the jobs are. So you have Politico Pro, you have, um, you have Bloomberg Government, you have something called Energy and Environment News now uh, that has hired a lot of writers covering environment and energy. So um, yeah, thinking about a specialized beat is, I think is something you can start to do as, as an undergrad. I would strongly encourage you to do so. And it also gets to what uh, out of the Shorenstein Center they're calling knowledge-based journalism. So your ability not only to have really great reporting and journalistic skills, but also to deep dive into the uh, peer-reviewed literature and science and social science, and to use that literature as a way to, report, uh, to inform your reporting. All right, folks, the room is getting to the high end of that hockey stick, so <laughs> <That's> uh, <good. laughs> let's thank Matt.